Hey everybody. Today we talk about self-compassion. We talk about what it is, why we need it, and why is it significant to the human experience. So this is the 10% happier self-care journey, a journey that I started in December of 2019. And I'm always excited to just talk about new topics. So I want to take you through the session that I went through today on self-compassion. And I'm going to paste my notes to the chat if you're watching live on Facebook. So that way you can follow along. And if you're watching afterwards on YouTube, then you'll see it in the description. Self-compassion. This is the 10% happier self-care journey. It's a common assumption that in order to succeed at making or breaking habits, that we need to be very hard on ourselves or beat ourselves up. Science shows is less likely to succeed this way or be an enjoyable process. <clears throat> Excuse me. When I think about that, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is just how true that is. You know, in our society, many times we look at, you know, dealing with our emotions in what I would consider a pretty topsy-turvy way. And what I mean by that is, you know, we've been taught to, in the past, you know, stuff down our emotions and not really deal with them as opposed to facing them, being honest with ourselves about them, you know, and just taking it one day at a time one experience at a time and being mindful you know that wasn't even a word i've you know i've never thought about this before mindfulness or be mindful was not a word i ever heard coming up in my household or even the community around me i never heard anyone say really be mindful until i got much older you know so Mindfulness just wasn't necessarily taught. It was taught in different ways, you know. But as far as it being how I understand it right now, it's a lot different. So I would say that it is definitely a common assumption that in order to succeed, that we feel like we need to be really hard on ourselves or stuff down in our emotions. This is actually counterproductive. And the science shows it. We're less likely to succeed this way. This makes me think about, you know, a couple years ago when I came up with the concept of how to stay consistent at doing something like going to the gym. And I realized that even though at one time I worked out for five or six days a week, I got to some point in life where that wasn't really realistic uh, with the rest of my time and responsibilities. So I decided to scale it back to three days a week, one hour. And I realized that was really good for me because it allowed me to be consistent and not have to beat myself up, you know. Um, So that was a way I applied self-compassion to my health and fitness. So when possible, having physical support in the form of an accountability partner can be very helpful and motivating. And we're talking about helpful and motivating in extending self-compassion to yourself, practicing self-compassion. It is always good to have an accountability partner, you know, and in this case, you know, with this session, they showed a video of two people that were supporting each other with self-compassion by just being there for each other, celebrating each other's successes. Uh, They were together like on a fitness journey, so to speak, living two different lives, but, you know, just both interested in the same thing. (laughs) as far as health and fitness, you know, being more active. So when you have the ability to have physical support, yes, this is definitely a bonus. But we don't always have that ability. And so that's why the most important thing to focus on, which is where we're going to spend the rest of our time here, is on delivering self-compassion to yourself. Having compassion for yourself doesn't mean letting yourself off the hook. It's quite the contrary. It means that you're not interested in punishing or demeaning yourself. Instead, you're looking for ways to positively reinforce 
and constructively support yourself. It's about being honest, making amends, and taking each next opportunity to get back on track and to make positive choices. I love that. You know, I love this this idea. It's not about letting yourself off the hook. Who's that? Who just gave me a thumbs up? I want to start saying hello to everyone. Drop a line. <laughs> How you all doing today? Happy Friday to everyone that's here. I love the fact that having compassion for yourself does not mean letting yourself off the hook. Because that's the thing that's not understood a lot of times. Whether we're applying it to ourselves or to others. Many people think that, you know, if you have compassion for someone else, that somehow that's going to mean that that person's perspective dominates or that person wins. I was just talking to someone about this recently. You know, that's really not the case. But since we've been brought up in a us versus them kind of society and with that kind of mentality, you know, it's really, really easy to get caught up in that mentality uh, and to not realize that having compassion doesn't mean letting yourself or letting others off the hook. It just means that you're not interested in punning, punishing or demeaning yourself or others. And that's really important because when you have that kind of attitude, that can allow you to deal with the whole situation better. You're looking for ways to constructively support yourself. Be honest, make amends, and take each opportunity to get back on track and to make better choices. This is all about being gentle with yourself. When you get off track, here's a three-step, three, I like working in threes, the trio feel. <laughs> when you get off track, here's a three-step mental exercise to help. <clears throat> Number one, acknowledge honestly, without judgment, that you're in a frustrating, painful, or uncomfortable moment. This is mindfulness. Acknowledging honestly, without judgment. You know, we've been taught to beat ourselves up so much. You know, a lot of times when we're frustrated, what immediately rushes in is self-judgment, or judgment of others. If it's not me, it has to be them. If it's not them, it has to be me. Instead of just saying, okay, this is how I feel. Right now, and I'm frustrated. Right now, I feel alone. Right now, and I'm, I feel betrayed. Right now, and I feel whatever that is. You know, and then it, acknowledging without judgment, that's just what it is. That's how I feel. It's okay. Even if I decide to change this, or even if this does change, Right now, this is how I feel. So acknowledging honestly, without judgment, that you're in a frustrating, painful, or uncomfortable moment. This is mindfulness. Number two, widen the lens. Understand that you are not alone. Everyone has these moments and experiences. It's really something to, to just remember that. That no matter what you're dealing with, there's someone else that can relate there's someone else that's dealing with that too and that's important because if you can remember that then that can allow you to naturally extend positive feelings to others and share your experiences which will naturally make other people share as well and then you find that place of commonality you know but it's about widening the lens if you don't feel alone you know th these this is what the studies show you know, as far as human beings, when we don't feel alone, it allows us to cope much, much better with life. You know, when we don't feel like we are by ourselves, you know, and that's that's one of the things, you know, speaking of which, even as I do this live stream by myself in my own room at times speaking to myself because there's no one, there's no numbers live. <laughs> it reminds you how much we are social creatures, you know, and that's what we reach for you know that's what's natural to us so when we're in that place of feeling connected to other people and feeling like they can relate and we can relate then we understand that we're not alone and that everyone has these moments and experiences 
somehow that literally just eases the pain to just think to yourself, yeah, my back is hurting right now, but there are a lot of other people whose backs hurt too, and now that makes my back hurt less. You know, I am alone right now because of social distancing. Yeah, and so is everyone else. So I guess we're all in this together. You know, I had this kind of epiphany years ago when I was in the midst of uh, a situation with someone close to me where it was a communication breakdown and we were going through emotionally. And the one thing, you know, they were really frustrated and I could have been really frustrated in the same way. But the thing that was allowing me to kind of stay even keel, and I mentioned this to them, to even consider this was that the only reason why I couldn't be upset because I could understand everybody else being upset as well in this equation. I could understand her frustration, you know, so it allowed me not to get so upset about my frustration, you know, with my frustration. And so it's just something about feeling like you're not alone that allows us to just naturally cope better and to be more understanding of others. So the third step is extend compassionate statements to yourself. Statements like, it's okay. You're doing the best that you can. And then you have uh, other statements that go kind of in a different direction. May I be happy or free of suffering? May I be well? May I be at peace? You know, I love these things because... There's a variety of statements that you can say to yourself, and the goal is for you to f make up statements that work for you. Um, you know, some of these can feel kind of fluffy and, and kind of heavy in your head, and then others can feel perfect for you. I kind of like, you know, because I use this a lot. If I'm dealing with something and I am frustrated, I'm trying to do something, I'm not being successful at it, you know, I'm beating myself up or feeling like I want to do that. I use that kind of language, like, you know, it's okay, like, I'm really doing the best that I can, you know, considering all the circumstances, the things that I have control over and the things that I don't have control over, I'm doing the best that I can, you know, and that helps me, you know, so you find what works for you. Self-compassion, here's another, another big thing, and this is like dispelling a myth right here. Self-compassion is not about weakness. It's actually about strength, honesty, ownership, accountability, patience, understanding, and balance. Being the boldest and bravest version of yourself, stepping up to the plate to self-care, embracing and being so understanding of yourself that you can then be the best that you can be to first yourself and then secondly the world around you. It's probably going to be my next TikTok that I put up, by the way. And if you're not following me on TikTok, why the hell not? I'm just playing. <laughs> I just got on TikTok myself. But go to uh, TikTok and look up Aaron Hill TV, two A's R O N Hill TV. And so this is going to be my next TikTok, naked TikTok. <laughs> I might not be naked in this one. So, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, again, all the more reason to go there now. <laughs> yeah, but that's going to be my next quote there. Seeing your goals, acknowledging your own pain. Actually, wait a minute, before I go on, let me, let me deal with that for a second. What we just, what I just laid out. Self-compassion is not about weakness. We grew up in a society, and I can say this as a man, you know, I grew up in a society where, you know, men don't cry, toughen up, be, in fact, the whole idea of be a man, be a man was about like, be tough, be, you know, raw, and not really deal with your emotions in a much more gentle and compassionate way. We were taught that that wasn't the way to be. So, and that wasn't really healthy at all because that is the way to be first of all it's just about being a decent human being you know um, but we were locked into stereotypes and you know all those kind of things but not only is it about being a decent human being it's the only thing that works 
It's the only thing that allows you to be har in harmony with yourself and in harmony with others. If you're, if you're compassionate to yourself, then you can be compassionate to the world around you. <clears throat> so it, it is not about weakness. It's actually about strength, honesty, ownership, accountability, patience, understanding, and balance. All the things that we aspire to. Being the boldest and bravest version of yourself. Stepping up to the plate. To self-care. Embracing and being so understanding of yourself that you can then be the best that you can be. So first, you, and then everybody else. Seeing your goals, acknowledging your own pain, and committing to do what's necessary to improve your circumstances and well-being. That doesn't sound like weakness at all to me. That sounds like stepping up to the plate and being, in my case, a grown-ass man. <laughs> and in your case, if it's the opposite, a grown-ass woman. Maturity is the name of the game here. And we're talking about emotional maturity. We're talking about emotional intelligence. Meeting tough moments with further negative self-criticism and shame make the problem worse. So the way that we have been taught to deal with our emotions in a very brute, that very forceful, that very stuff it down type of way is toxic. It makes the problem worse. It makes it worse. So since we are evolving, since we have evolved, we know more now. Like they say, when you know better, hopefully you do better. We know better now. We know that things like epileptic epileptic seizures aren't demons and we also know that crying even if you're a man is not somehow lame or somehow like yeah no it means you're more of a man you know taking the time to say to have compassion to someone else means you're more of a man when you could punch the person in the face but instead, you decide to practice compassion and mindfulness and say, you know, if I was in his shoes based on what he dealt with in his upbringing. Uh, so, you know, I am upset, but at the same time, allows you to deal with things better. So stuffing it down and then bringing negative criticism and shame make the problem increasingly worse. Here's a three-step compassion practice. Number one, mindfulness, which is what we've been touching on. Being present, being fully present without judgment. Thinking about some of the obstacles or challenges you face that have affected you. You know, this is really relating to yourself. Thinking about things, obstacles that were out of your control challenges that you face you couldn't control your upbringing you couldn't control the fact that your family was broken or that your family was very dysfunctional and so it brought you up in the midst of dysfunction that's not your fault you could not control that so being able to think about some of those obstacles and then not judging the feelings that come up during these memories just accepting acknowledging and being present with them Number two, common humanity. Remembering that you are not alone. Even if it's just me telling you this, you are not alone. I understand because I deal with same things. Common humanity. Remembering that you are not alone in your struggles. That it isn't personal. And that others are going through the same things and can relate. Recognizing the shared human experience. You know, that is, once again, once you realize other people relate to you, it just makes, it eases the pain. You know, it's funny. Uh, I'll mention this here really quickly. Um, as if I can do anything really quickly. Perla, how are you? How are you today? Good to see you. Happy Friday. I think you'll like this one. So... I'm going to take a second to explain what I call the kissing the boo-boo effect, which is the most magical effect 
kissing the boo boo should be at the top of the medical charts as far as cures. I'm about to, that's gonna be my next Facebook post. <laughs> kissing the boo, like mother kissing the boo boo, you know, dad kissing the boo. Kissing the boo boo should be at the top of our healing modalities. And the reason why is because it has nothing to do with the fact <laughs> that that kissing the boo-boo will actually like totally heal, you know, what's going on. The thing about it is that it's what we're seeing is something that resides in a completely different place here. It's psychological. The kissing the boo-boo and the reason why that makes the child feel better or the adult feel better is because it's the same thing. It's really about empathy. It's really about relating to someone and saying, I care about how you feel and so much so that I'm even going to show you even through a physical manifestation of that because I deeply, deeply care about it being better. And that eases the pain. Because the child goes from being hurt by themselves to being with someone else who they can relate to and who can relate to them. And so it actually feels better to the kid after that. And I would argue that the science shows that the reason why that is, is because of this aspect of compassion and what it really feels like and what it really does to us and, and to our vibration and everything like that when we truly experience and share compassion with each other it really does affect our molecules and our atoms it really does impact us in a very very deep way so that common humanity remembering that you're not alone in your struggles recognizing the shared human experience and then the third aspect of this equation is self-kindness, realizing that it's the nature of life to have both joyful experiences and challenging experiences, challenging and stressful experiences. Telling yourself it's okay, you're doing the best that you can, like we talked about earlier, or just start again is a way of introducing kindness to yourself into the equation. Being patient, forgiving, and empathetic to oneself goes a long way. Goes a very long way. It's the nature of life. This is just what life is. You know, this is why I'm always so sensitive about certain spiritual and religious modalities and, wh and why I say that my religion is acceptance over expectation. Because what winds up happening is sometimes in our efforts of optimistic thinking, we forget that life is just what it is. It's just a collection of joyful and positive experiences and not so positive experiences. Or I don't even want to say positive because that I want to make it more bare bones than that. So it's not our subjective opinions injected into it, you know, because we determine what's positive and what's not um, but just that that's what life is life life is a collection of these experiences some that really feel good to us and some that don't but like if you realize that egocentrism which is thinking that this is all about us like the idea that this entire world was created for us then it sets you into the position of not being able to have acceptance of what life is. Just understand this is the reality of what it is. Appreciate the, the goods, appreciate the things that you feel good to you and work towards your benefit of living as a human being and accepting those things that are a natural part of the equation that are on the opposite side, that are trying to take you out every day, like viruses and diseases and these kind of things. You know, that's just what life is. Sometimes, though, we celebrate the good so much that we get attached to them as if as if that's the only thing that life is about. No, it's just it's a balance of the two, as we know. And it's good to celebrate. But I recognize it like 
in this analogy. And this was one of the things that I started thinking about again with certain uh, religious and spiritual modalities and theologies. You know, I feel like the ultimate way to peace now is is staying ground level, not not going up, staying ground level. The reason why is because what I mean by going up is, you know, as we invest in positive thoughts, ones that we have like good reason to because they're very practical and they, they work and they make sense. But they aren't always the case. Like it isn't always the case that I'm going to be well. I'm going to be sick one day. I'm going to die one day. It's good to celebrate wellness. But when you make it like it's the only reality and you keep going up, it's like being on the bottom floor of a building and then going up, 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 up. And then all of a sudden, when you do fall, because you will fall one day, and by, what I mean by falling is that this principle won't be true one day. Like, it just won't be true, because that won't be how life goes. It'll be the inevitable things that happen. Then it'll be reality. A person will be forced to accept it, and then they come crashing down. Because it's like, wait a minute, I haven't been investing in this the entire time. I've been investing in expectation, not acceptance. And so my philosophy is that when you go up that high, when you fall off of a seven stories because you've gone up, you fall hard. But if you stay even keel and you accept it all, then when you fall, you're, you're, you're only on level one. So it doesn't hurt as bad. Your level of acceptance is there and you're not getting into unrealistic ways of thinking about life. That's my rant for the day. My Ace Ventura. I got to learn how to do it in an Ace Ventura voice, though. <laughs> Be like, so what I'm saying to you is this, and he just starts rolling. <laughs> so, self kindness. And then this very last thought that we come to and bring this to a close that self compassion is the very thing that creates the emotional resilience and presence to deal with the challenges that we will inevitably face. I want to read that one more time. That's so good. That's like one of those ones that's got to, if you, that's one of those, like if you remember nothing else, self-compassion is the very thing that creates the emotional resilience and presence to deal with the challenges that we will inevitably face. And so that's the self-care session for the day. Before we go, we're going to do something that I call the 30-second meditation technique. And I'm doing this for myself in order to de-escalate from this moment. Um, and for anybody else out there to understand that getting into meditation doesn't mean having the right lighting or the right Aaron Hill music like you hear in the background. Breath of life that you can download on any platform. Please and uh, thank you. <laughs> now, but that's a breath, breath of life. And it's a meditation that I wrote. Uh, at the top of this year for a guided meditation called Breathe Deeply. You can find that on YouTube if you go to Aaron Hill TV. Just look up Breathe Deeply on YouTube, Aaron Hill, and you'll hear this song behind it, which is called Breath of Life. And this is available on all platforms. Please add it to your playlist, your Spotify, Apple Music, and all that good stuff. And so you don't need that, though, in order to meditate. <laughs> uh, you know, you just need a few moments of intentionality, a few moments of focused intention. So I realized that all you need is 30 seconds and you can do this anywhere. You can even do it while you're driving because all it's about is taking three deep breaths and having 10 seconds of just non-judgmental mindfulness. So I'm going to close my eyes and I'm going to settle in, but you can just settle in in any way that you like based on what makes sense for where you are. So dealing with self-compassion is, you know, is something that is really important. So we're just going to inhale on that thought through the nose and we're going to exhale through the mouth. Long inhales, long exhales. And we're doing this because of the fact that it, you know, delivers oxygen to the body. It allows us to de-escalate in any moment in time that we need it. And it's just plain good for the organs and the limbs. So on that note, we're going to take a deep breath in through the nose and 
out through the mouth. Another deep breath in and out. And then on this final deep breath in, I like to make a suggestion to make the thought be one of just not judging yourself when you feel what you feel. You know, not judging yourself when you fail, when you're trying to to commit to a new habit or you're trying to follow through with something. Just not judging yourself first. Allowing you to just feel the emotion that you feel and just understand that your next opportunity, your next moment is the opportunity to be able to create another positive moment in a direction that you like. So all is not lost. So on that, let's take a deep breath in through the nose and out through the mouth. And then for this last 10 seconds, you can continue to allow your breath to be paced like that, or you can just allow it to go back to its normal pace. And we're just gonna take 10 seconds of just non-judgmental silence to just take that in. And on that tip, if you have your eyes closed, you can open them and come back to this stream of consciousness. One last thing I just want to leave you with is that you know, it just is what it is. Like this is this is what life is. Be gentle with yourself, you know. The more gentle you are with yourself, the better you do. So, thank you all for joining me. Perla says, "Thanks. Lunch is over. Needed that boost." I appreciate you, Perla. I'm so glad that you um, were able to experience some Friday goodness from that. (laughs) And so I appreciate you all. If you would like to donate to my efforts to make content like this and the other content that you see me do, then uh, you can do so by dropping a tip. The information is in the description of this video. Other than that, please drop your comments on what self-compassion is for you and what from this you agree with, disagree with, would add your two cents to, et cetera, et cetera. And I'll see you the next time. Until then, continue to self-care. Take care.